Some bosses are absolutely brutal in Mythic Plus, and one mistake is all it takes to brick your key. But don't worry, because in today's video, we're going to cover some of the hardest bosses you will face in higher keys, teaching you tips and tricks that will make them much easier. To do this, we sat down with players from Echo and Method to see what they think are the most difficult fights, both in terms of numbers and in terms of mechanics. Half of these bosses will be DPS or healer checks, testing to see how well players can do their rotation while managing cooldowns. The other half will be mechanical nightmares, requiring players to multitask like they are playing Dance Dance Revolution. So stay tuned as we rank the hardest Mythic Plus bosses for Dragonflight Season 2 while giving you some tips on how to beat them. First up, we have three numbers difficult bosses. These will either be DPS or healing checks and require careful cooldown management. The Catriarch Rathai in Brackenhide Hollow is our first pick for a major DPS check. Not on the boss herself, but on the totems that will spawn throughout the fight, but more on that later. To start the encounter, Tank should pull Rathai close to the side of the walls. This is because she will quickly cast a frontal called Choking Rock Cloud, dealing heavy damage and spawning a cloud that travels around the inside perimeter of the room. Getting hit by the cloud will silence players and apply a debuff called Withering Rot, which decreases damage done while it's active. Tanks need to constantly reposition the boss so that she is directly across from the moving cloud. If done correctly, tanks can aim the totems that Rathai summons, which she will spawn on opposite ends of the arena. If aimed well, the totems should appear far away from the cloud. Here we have our DPS check. Everyone in the group should swap to these totems immediately since they will cast Rotting Burst, which deals AoE damage and applies Withering Rot to every player. She will spawn two totems during each phase, and even numbered totems will overlap with Decaying Strength, which requires players to spread out to avoid overlapping AoE explosions. This ability increases Rathai's damage based on the number of active Withering Rot stacks, but clears them in the process. Even numbered totems are a good time to use personals since the overlapping mechanics cause high AoE damage. Once Decaying Strength has been cast, the fight will start over. The learning curve for this fight is cooldown management. We want enough damage to kill each totem efficiently. DPS should consider staggering their cooldowns with members of their party, with the goal of having at least one player capable of contributing a large amount of damage to every totem. Sometimes there might be gaps in damage, and when this happens, beacon trinkets can be used in place of offensive CDs, but again, should be staggered to help kill future totems if needed. Moving on, we have a different numbers check, this time for healers. Kajin the Unyielding is a notoriously challenging boss on the healing side, no matter what spec you play. Throughout the room, you will see two types of ice boulders. One has a smooth surface, and the other is more jagged, indicating it has been damaged. The smooth ones are the ones we care about most, and for this boss, we will be referring to them as the smooth boulders. From the moment the fight starts, everyone in the group will be taking massive AoE damage from polar winds, which lasts the entire encounter. This mechanic, along with the precise movement and other forms of AoE damage, is what makes this fight incredibly intense. As a healer, you may be tempted to dispel her Frost Shocks, which apply a slow, but due to the intense healing required on this fight, dispelling isn't worth the GCD. Tanks should immediately pull the boss close to, but not on top of the nearest smooth boulder, and everyone else should spread out nearby. The boss will periodically cast Frozen Cyclone, which aims an arrow towards players and launches a tornado that will destroy any boulder within its path. Because of this, make sure you position it in a way that baits the arrow away from any smooth boulders, especially since the hitbox is wider than you might think. The reason the party should be positioned close to a smooth boulder is due to the hailstorm effect, which requires players to position behind them to avoid getting hit by lethal damage. If you pre-position well, everyone can hide behind the same boulder, allowing your healer to easily AoE heal, while also allowing melee to attack the boss through the boulder. Once Hailstorm finishes, be sure to move away from the boulder before it explodes. Shortly after Hailstorm, the boss will cast Glacial Surge. You will want to position yourself slightly outside the initial circle, which will then allow you to reposition into the inner circle once it converts into this donut shape. Then we will simply repeat back to the start of the encounter, having the tank reposition the boss near a fresh smooth boulder, while everyone else positions in a way to prevent Frost Cyclone from breaking it. To help out your healer, everyone should ideally be ready to hide behind the same boulder to allow your healer to AoE heal more effectively and eliminating any potential range issues. This is especially important if you are playing with any healers with frontal cone healing abilities like Preservation of Ochres, Holy Paladins, and even Restoration Shamans. As a healer, the difficulty in the fight comes from the constant AoE damage combined with periodic repositioning. In higher keys, you should consider pooling resources for the moments where movement is needed. As a Holy Paladin, for instance, you might want to consider holding on to Beacon and banking some Holy Power prior to moving. That way you have some instant cast group healing when needing to reposition. 
Every healer will encounter some difficult periods of downtime where AoE healing is still on cooldown. These are the moments where it is helpful to trade a personal defensive in order to give your healer a buffer for healing to be available once again. As a final note, this fight is much more manageable with a Guardian Druid as a tank since they provide tons of off healing, but this is certainly not required. Rounding out our numbers difficult fights, let's head to Vortex Pinnacle, where we have an intense throughput check for both DPS and healers. The last boss in this dungeon can be a nightmare of overlapping mechanics, the first being Chain Lightning. This spell will be casted on a single target and will bounce to nearby players within the circular radius. When the fight starts, the group should preemptively spread out around the boss so that players don't have to move very far when Chain Lightning is cast. Shortly after the first Chain Lightning, the boss will then summon a Skyfall Nova, which everyone should treat like the Rot Burst totems we saw in Brackenhide Hollow. This is our DPS check, since we need to kill these Novas quickly to avoid getting overwhelmed by AoE damage. While this is happening, be sure to monitor the boss's static cling channel, which will hit players hard unless they are mid-air when the cast finishes. You do have some leeway with timing, but be ready to jump right before the cast ends. The next mechanic is the intermission phase, where the boss draws a triangle on the ground, which everyone will need to stand in to avoid getting hit by the supremacy of the storm. Be careful though, because immediately after finishing this channel, the boss will cast a chain lightning. At this point, we will just rinse and repeat every mechanic. The true execution test for healers on this boss is the overlap of the Skyfall Novas and Chain Lightning. When this happens, everyone will be taking huge AoE damage, which means Chain Lightning becomes more lethal. During this overlap, be ready to use a damage reduction cooldown, or make sure to top players targeted by Chain Lightning before it connects to minimize the risk of a one-shot. Just like in Brackenite Hollow, the goal of DPS on this fight is to stagger cooldowns in order to kill each Skyfall Nova quickly. Once again, Beacon Trinkets will come in handy during any moments where offensives aren't available. This fight can be relatively long, which allows two-minute cooldowns to be used twice during the encounter. Bloodlusting on the second wave of cooldowns is often the most efficient, but can also be used as an emergency means to kill mid-fight Skyfall Novas when other cooldowns aren't available. With our DPS and healing checks covered, let's move on to three mechanically challenging bosses. First up, we have Emberon from Uldaman. This boss is a visual nightmare, with the colors of the mechanics blending in with the floor of the room. If you aren't paying close enough attention at all times, you will die to mechanics you literally didn't see coming. Throughout the room are multiple small vault keepers. Once the boss is pulled, some of these keepers will glow red and will continuously cast slow moving fireballs at targeted players. Tanks should pull Emberon towards an inactive keeper, making sure to face the boss away from the group. That way the tank is the only player getting hit by the frontal searing clap, and by positioning near an inactive keeper, we minimize the chance of getting hit by seeking flame while making it easier to see other visuals. When Searing Clap is cast, everyone in the group will get a burning heat dot. If you have a priest in the group, this is when you will want to use Mass Dispel to put less strain on your healer. Throughout the first phase, Emberon will cast Unstable Embers, which causes an AoE explosion under every player, requiring everyone to spread out before it explodes. Before the intermission phase, Emberon will cast Unstable Embers and then immediately use Searing Clap. This results in brutal damage to the entire group and is a fantastic time to use personal cooldowns. If Mass Dispelling isn't an option, use Stone Form to help clear the Burning Heat debuff. The intermission will start when Emberon paths to the center of the room and will become unattackable until all Vault Keepers are killed. Despite being an intermission, players will still need to play well. First up, everyone in the group will start to take bursts of damage every 3 seconds. Now, this wouldn't be an issue by itself, except for the fact that the room will be split in half by purging flames. The combination of these two mechanics means that players need to be on the same side of the room, both to kill keepers quickly and, more importantly, to make sure everyone is in range of their healer. While all this is happening, players should still pay attention to the fireballs, which will continue throughout this phase. If you didn't use Bloodlust on pull, then make sure to use it at the end of the intermission, as the boss will reset back to the original phase, and we don't want the fight to drag into another intermission. Immediately after the intermission is over, we will have another overlap of Unstable Embers into Searing Clap. Once again, be ready to save personals for this moment, and look to use MD the moment Burning Heat is applied. Then continue the fight as before, making sure to dodge fireballs and spread out to prevent any splash damage. As long as you manage to get the boss to 10%, there will not be another intermission. Next up we have Naroxus in Neltharian's Lair, which is another fight where we have multiple overlapping mechanics. During most of this encounter, there needs to be at least one player in melee range, which will typically be the tank in order to prevent AoE damage on the party. Throughout the fight, Naraxis will target the two furthest players with Rancid Maw, which will spawn puddles that will be used to slow two Worm Speaker devout mobs that jump down from the crowd above and sprint towards the boss. Naraxis will consume these mobs for a damage bonus, which will almost certainly result in a wipe. 
The two worm speaker devouts will also spawn in the same place, which means the two furthest players should intentionally position here to place the puddles. It is possible to pre-damage the mobs in the stands above right before they jump, but the moment they hit the ground, they need to be killed as quickly as possible. If the mobs miss the puddles, then be sure to use any available snare effects. Naraxxus will also create poison pools around her, which the tank and melee should move out of. When this happens, a poison debuff will be applied to everyone in the group, which will tick very hard and will need to be dealt with immediately due to an overlapping mechanic where NPCs in the crowd above will periodically throw rocks at players down below. In higher keys, if the rock hits a player with a poison debuff, there's a very high chance that they will die. Poison dispels should be assigned before the fight starts. Because multiple debuffs are applied all at once, poison cleansing totem and stone form are powerful counters to this mechanic. Otherwise, players will need to be individually dispelled. If no poison dispel is available, it might be necessary to trade a damage reduction personal to avoid dying to overlapping mechanics. After casting Rancid Maw a second time, Naraxxus will start casting Spiked Tongue on the tank, which will lasso them toward the boss. To prevent from being consumed, the tank should run as far away from Naraxxus as possible. Be sure to use any speed increases to help your tank gain distance. Then, when getting pulled toward the boss, the tank should use the Rancid Maw puddles to slow their momentum. Note that one set of puddles will disappear, but the freshest set will still be active. Right before the spike tongue cast finishes, the tank should move closer to the boss to avoid the penalty of having no player in melee range. It's possible for some tanks to cheese spike tongue by positioning themselves behind the eggs in the back of the room, which will prevent the lasso effect. Demon hunters can do this reliably, though other tanks might struggle. In any case, after spike tongue ends, the fight will start over, which means DPS should be ready to pre-position rancid mob puddles to slow the mobs, and everyone needs to be on top of dispels to prevent overwhelming damage. The scary part of this encounter is when Rancid Maw overlaps with both the poison debuff and boulder attacks from the mobs above. If no poison dispels are available, it is very likely that a personal defensive will be needed. Staying in Neltharian's lair, we have our final boss for this video, Dark Gruul. The huge obstacle in this fight is Magma Breaker, which does damage to the entire group every time the boss takes a step. Throughout every phase, tanks should limit how much the boss moves and instead rely more on turning the boss left and right to deal with other mechanics. The DPS and healer should immediately position on the left side of the boss in order to bait out crystal spikes, making sure to quickly move away from the AoE circle once it appears. Then the boss summons an add to his left, which will immediately get stunned by the spikes and will take 100% increased damage for 10 seconds. Just like the boss, these adds will do AoE damage every time they move, and if not killed quickly, will fixate on players, so be sure to kill them quickly before the stun fades. While this is happening, the tank will be getting hit by a frontal called Landslide, which will launch them back. Be sure to quickly move back to the boss, aiming to stack Dargul on top of the ad for maximum cleave damage. Every Landslide will be followed by a Molten Crash, hitting the tank for a substantial amount. Regardless of whether the first ad is dead, Dargul will cast spikes again, so be sure everyone spreads out to avoid getting hit or reposition the ad to get spiked a second time. Crystal Spikes will then be cast a third time, leaving behind a wall that players will need to hide behind to avoid getting hit by Magma Wave. Everyone, including the tank, will need to hide behind the boulder for the entire duration of the channel. Magma Wave will leave a volcano on the ground, which will erupt, and then deal damage to random targets every 5 seconds. While this happens, the boss will need to reposition, minimizing movement, since we now have another damaging mechanic to deal with. Just like before, DPS will revert back to positioning on Dargul's left side to bait the next Crystal Spike. Again, by positioning on the left side of the boss, the spike will immediately stun the next Magma Sculptor, which DPS should nuke once again. It is highly likely that damage won't be high enough to kill the mob before the stun fades, which means the group will have to bait another crystal spike for a second stun. Shortly after, we will have a third spike, which will create the line of sight needed to hide from Magma Wave. Luckily, every new Magma Wave will despawn the previous volcano, but will spawn a new one, requiring the tank to reposition once again. Anytime the tank is forced to reposition, there will be an increased group group damage, which signals a great time to use personals. Like many of the bosses we've covered today, Dargul requires careful cooldown management, both for surviving overlapping damage mechanics and for being able to efficiently kill adds, especially in the middle of the fight when there is increased damage from the erupting volcano. Before we wrap things up, we want to hear from you. We're currently working alongside some of the best players in the world to develop high quality guides for Mythic Plus. With that in mind, what topics would you like us to cover next? Do you have any specific pain points you would like help with? Let us know in the comments below. And if you like this video and want to see more, be sure to subscribe. As always though, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.